This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Roya Mohammadi radiated light. Sometimes it came through her love for Marvel movies and cartoons, which she could chatter about in any of one of four languages. Sometimes it flowed through her conversations as she dreamed of starting her own marketing company. Sometimes she just reached out with a joke, and it was as if a whole star-strewn galaxy lived in her laugh. This is the opening of Lucy Gelman's latest obituary for New Haven's arts paper. In 2,000 words, she relays some of Roya's legacy. A 29-year-old Afghan immigrant, translator, and aspiring marketing professional. A fallen star in a small and close-knit city. Whether they've been written by a local newsroom or a loved one, obituaries are an earnest attempt at the impossible. Distilling one person's life in a few pages, or sometimes even just a few paragraphs. Coming up, we discuss this very delicate and dying art with Lucy Gelman, and later we'll also have Mary McGreevy, who shares tips from dead people on her TikTok account. But first, journalist Kristen Hare is something of an obituaries expert. She's a writer for Pointer and Tampa Bay Times, where she writes obits for the Times and a weekly newsletter for Pointer called How They Lived, as well as Bucket List Books. Thanks so much, Kristen, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. And I just want to remind our listeners that you can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And as well, I want to add a note, too, if you're dealing with grief and need to talk to somebody, you can call SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. It's free, confidential, and available 24-7. So, Kristen, I want to start by asking you if you can help us get a sense of how we might define an obituary today, because these aren't just feature obituaries often pre-written by newsrooms or the paid death notices that we might see in a paper. Yeah, obituaries can be so many things. And, and so they went from something that was, you know, really two things. One, which was a paid obituary that would run in the newspaper after someone died. And two, um, a news obituary about someone notable in your community that would be written on deadline as soon as the death of that person was known. Many newsrooms have these pre-written for, for you know, well-known people um, so that when they die, that obituary can be updated. But technology, I think, has has made this obituaries so much more accessible and interesting in some ways. And in some ways, they're still really stuck in the, you know, pay-per-word format that we've had. So the obituaries that I write are about regular people who live in, lived in Tampa Bay, um, and I've been doing it for five years. And the goal from the beginning was to remind people in our community what they had in common, past how they voted and how they prayed and how they loved, that living in the same space as someone and understanding who people were that that have died is valuable and helps connect us past the things that are in the media that can be so divisive. Well, I love that. Um, that you mentioned the commonality of people, and and we will get into this portion of it later in the conversation. But I've also written my fair share of obituaries, and it certainly is an art and and something that a lot of us are not really trained to do. But kind of want to talk about the more technicality stuff and for for a moment is a lot of these are actually very cost prohibited. I I was actually very shocked when I was working in newspapers of how expensive these might be. Can you talk about those options and how that might actually be inaccessible for a lot of people? Yeah, it, it is. And if you open up wherever you live, if you open up the, the newspaper, assuming you still have one and um, and assuming that it's still in print, which are two very big assumptions, um, and you look at the obituaries, what you will probably see and what I see every week when I'm scanning for people I'd like to learn more about is a lot of old white men. Um, and their stories are fabulous, but um, the people who often have the resources to take out, you know, to have enough money to to have several newspaper column inches, um, they were talking, you know, three thousand dollars maybe, um, to let people know that someone died. They're they're typically not reflective of the entire community. So um, I have had to work very hard 
to make sure to sort of build in some extra filters to check the funeral homes that serve black and brown populations um, specifically in Tampa Bay and to let um, our community know that I want to know about everybody's lives, not just the people who can afford to take these out uh, in the paper. The the flip side of this, though, um, and this is, I think, what makes it really difficult for the newspaper industry is that, you know, local news is is struggling, has been struggling for a decade, and uh, paid obituaries are a reliable source of, um, of, of revenue. And so how do you stop charging for something that is, you know, helping your business? Um, we have seen several newsrooms that are digital only around the country start to offer these for free, to run these for free, because they view it as a way of building loyalty. But the, the whole industry is still... Um, the, the paid obituary industry is still quite stuck in uh, the place that it started and um, really leaves a lot of, of lives out of the public view. Well, I, I certainly heard that um, in the newsrooms that I have been a part of. And, and you kind of answered this a little bit by saying that you want to learn about the people in your community. But I still have to ask, you know, what inspired you to focus on obituaries as you have in your writing? So. Every young journalist at some point in their first job is going to, someone's going to throw an obituary at them. Hey, you know, the mayor died, the lady who ran the most popular deli died. We need you to write about them really quickly. And um, for me, that happened in every job that I've had. My heart has always been in features writing and specifically in profiles and understanding who people are and, and reflecting them in a way that feels accurate to them, but also, you know, not not too shiny or um, sparkly, but but really real and honest. And I think that someplace in the first 10 years of my career, there was a realization for me that obituaries were a way to write a profile, um, a challenge because you're not talking to your subject. You have to talk to people who knew them. And um, you're trying to capture who someone was in you know, a thousand words or less. Um, but also they're about your community. There are tiny histories, I like to say. Um, they show where the place you lived, uh, what it was like, and how far it's come. They can deal with major issues that are happening in your community. And um, so there's, there's just these really, I think, vibrant reflections. Um, one of the things that people ask me when I tell them that I write obits, I get two comments. One is, Oh, what's that like? And the other is, oh, what's that like? And um, I think that that people think that it's sad, and it can be really sad, especially if you're writing about someone who's younger. But I'm so inspired by the lessons that um, I learned from the the lives of the people that I write about. It absolutely shapes how I approach the world, and um, so I I just think it's this very special opportunity, and it's probably the last thing that will be published about a person, and that feels that has a special responsibility that that feels um, like a, a great gift to get to be part of. I love that too that you mentioned these tiny histories because they are very big histories in these in these people's lives, and to be privileged to be a part of that, I always felt like, oh man, I wish I knew this person that I'm writing about is what I tend to get out from them. And so you really considered this art of obituaries from a lot of different angles. How are you starting to think about this now? You know, it's not just a hard skill for a journalist and newsroom. You know, what what can people use beyond beyond that? And if it is this something that we can all maybe think about differently? Are we thinking about it differently? We should be thinking about it differently. And I, I mean, you know, my first recommendation for your audience is like, you need to be writing your own obituary. If you haven't done it already, like what's important to you? I most certainly have written my own obituary already. My family knows where to find it when they need it, uh, which I hope will be for, you know, many decades. But um, these are, this is an opportunity to have a conversation with someone in your life because chances are someone like me or someone like Lucy Gelman you know, aren't going to know about the death of someone that you cared about or or when the time comes your death. And so there's 
the chances are you will be writing an obituary for someone you love. And the more information you have before that happens, the better of a job you're going to be able to do. For instance, is it important that that it, you know, the first three lines we say where you graduated from high school? I don't care about that. I want you to know that I was in the Peace Corps in Guyana and I met my husband there and we've been married for 20 years, right? There are so many more interesting things about my life than kind of what's in my, my you know, CV. Um, what matters to you? What do you want the people in your in your life to know and to highlight? And you know, my favorite obituaries are the ones that people write themselves. They have a sense of humor um, and we're all going to die. This is not a secret. Um, this is a reality that we're all facing. And so I think having these conversations can preserve your own history um, and can actually get you closer to someone and help you n- better understand the people in your life if you're um, if they're open to talking about their life and their legacy. Well, and speaking of someone who can help us understand that too better is uh, Lucy Gelman. She's an editor for the Arts Paper, which is an editorially independent arm of the Arts Council of Greater New Haven. Thanks for joining us, Lucy. Thank you for having me. And Lucy, you know, you've written such moving and long form obituaries about local community members. Can you tell us more about Roya uh, Mohamandi that we introduced um, at the top of the show? Yeah, absolutely. So Roya um, partly is an example. Often I'm hearing from people, um, friends or family of the deceased um, or a loved one. And Roya is an example of that. So New Haven is a tiny, tiny community. It's big for Connecticut, but it's pretty small in in the scope of the world. And um, in New Haven, there is a community of uh, mostly refugee and immigrant women who gather within Havenly, which is a job incubator, professional incubator that has really amazing uh, fellowship program that is meant to foster professional development within this community of women who maybe have come into this country um, with huge skills that are not recognized as marketable skills by, um, by folks who are white Americans, frankly. And Roya uh, was part of the Career Bridges Fellowship Program at Havenly, which was pretty new, but she had also come in as a translator. This is someone who spoke four languages, had been born in Afghanistan, and made her way to the U.S. and specifically to New Haven to uh, to study marketing and business at UNH, and was incredibly reliable. And so in late February, her colleagues at Havenly noticed that she didn't show up to translate for an exam for this fellowship program. And that was very unlike her. And so they started calling her, they started emailing her, and they didn't hear back from her. And ultimately, they reported her missing to the police. And West Haven PD realized that this was the same person um, who I, 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 it's a it's still a pending case, so I don't want to say too much. Um, but this was the same person who they had found deceased. And there are a lot of questions around the way that Roya passed um, and the way that I think she was taken away from the world very prematurely. This is a young person that we're talking about. And I really want to stress that the there is a sisterhood at Havenly that has been asking questions and really pushing both to remember her legacy and to honor her legacy and to answer these questions around the the way in which she she died and she was taken away from us. And it it feels very much like you, you're doing so much more than just telling her story. You're asking questions, you're doing journalism. And but at the end of the day, she is a sister. She's a friend. And how do you think about the work you do and its significance to those loved ones affected, but also the larger community? I mean, just by reading those couple of lines, I'm so inspired, but also very saddened by by what's happened. Yeah, I I mean, I think, Catherine, that you get at a bigger question for me about why I do obit work. It's not something that I expected to be part of my job when I started at the Arts Paper a little over five years ago, but I see it as a community need. There was a need. Um, people were experiencing grief, and sometimes there was nowhere for them to put that grief, and certainly with Havenly, but in many examples before it, and unfortunately, probably in many examples that will come, 
someone reached out and said, like, I feel completely alone in this ocean of grief. Can you use this one skill that you have to do something? And the answer is yes. If, if that is a small kindness that I can provide for someone who is mourning, of course. And, and so I see it as a service, especially in a community that is so small like New Haven. Chances are you may not have known Roya, but you probably know someone who did know her. And we've been talking a bit about how local news landscape has changed so much in this art and and how decisions are being made. And you mentioned, you know, if this is a kindness that you can do, you know, why not? Can you talk about also, you know, how are newsrooms rethinking who who is worthy of these feature yeah. obituaries? Because that, to me, it, it's a fair question, but it's also a very inhumane question, I think, in some level. Yeah, I I will say at the arts paper, I'm incredibly lucky to have both the trust of my boss, who has given me the gift of time. So I can say to her, I'm sorry, I'm working on an obituary. And that means we're going to publish fewer pieces this week, because this long form obit really means a lot to me. I will say as a as a reporter, and I'm a white middle class woman, I try to really think about how do I take the fundamentals of reporting and um, sort of weave in a lens of anti-racism to my work and think about the harm that has been done because of white supremacy in this country for hundreds and hundreds of years. And how do I undo that in my work? And does that mean that I never write about white people who have passed away? No, absolutely not. Some of the pieces that I have spent the most time on are memorializing um, you know, heterosexual, cisgender, white men who have died, some of whom have passed before their time. Um, but it also means that I am thinking about uh, about the community and about who made an impact on the community who may not have been remembered otherwise. I'm also very lucky in that, so I've lived in New Haven for 10 years and that has allowed me to build trust within the community. So usually when I work on an obituary, it's not specifically because I've found, uh, occasionally I will find the name of someone who has passed. And I thought, oh goodness, I need to write about this person because they were a poet or because they were a musician and, and they made a real impact. But often it's someone's mother or cousin or child or loved one who reaches out to me and says, you may not know this, but my cousin was in a choir in New Haven in the 1980s and he went on to sing on Broadway and he was an amazing person and I would love for you to write about his life. And for me, that's a real honor that someone comes to me who maybe knows my work, maybe doesn't, and trusts me to write about their loved one. Like that, it it does not stop to be, uh, it it does not cease to be astounding to me that that people put their trust in me to write about someone who has passed on. And, and Kristen, I would love to hear about what you think too with what Lucy just said, and and also you know how our newsrooms rethinking who who should have these feature obituaries, or can you make those decisions? Yeah, I I think that what what Lucy is is saying in the larger trend is that you know there have always been people deciding what and who is important and those people have always been you know mostly white men and they still are in our industry um and so to to decide who who is important means like redefining what is important mean and for me what important means is like did they le- live a life that was interesting that we can learn from and that will resonate with members of our community um, i wrote an obituary a couple weeks ago about jane davis doggett and she was in the 1950s this pioneering designer who recreated how we use public spaces. She basically was the pioneer of wayfinding. And she has made airports. She designed Tampa International Airport and using um, a color system and an ABC system, which is incredible, like so simple, it was radical. She is the reason that public spaces are or are not, <laughs> if they don't use her her methods, uh, easy to work, to move through. And that is incredibly important. That says so much about our um, our community and and the industries, and she did this in the fifties when there were no women working in the aviation industry. So I think that um, what I'm looking for is a spark of life that I think other people will will find um, resonance with, and more and more newsrooms. Um, I think, especially as you get into the ranks of reporters, 
certainly see the value in this. I don't know that they ever didn't see the value in this. It's a question of resources. And um, most newsrooms are maybe a quarter of the size they were two decades ago um, and have you know incredible uh, challenges, particularly newspapers, but also public media stations and television stations um, in front of them. So the changes that are happening are typically happening the most powerfully at um, online only newsrooms where they don't have the 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 legacy you know traditions um, of well this person was important capital I and we have to write about them and so a couple of them I'll I'll mention Berkeley side and the Oakland side in California and Richland Source in Mansfield Ohio are among the places that are are running free obituaries for their communities because they believe it's their duty to um, reflect the lives of the people who live there and if they don't who will. And so um, we're we're really just in the midst of this right now. And if people questioning this and thinking um, carefully about it, for me, um, you know, the Tampa Bay Times is a locally owned newspaper. It is one of few that is, I think, still healthy and well. And I want to put work in that um, newspaper and, and online that is valuable, that people want to come back for, and that those with means want to support um, so that it continue to be, it can continue to be healthy and well and, and really look like Tampa Bay. You've been listening to Tampa Bay Times and Pointer writer Kristen Hare and arts paper editor Lucy Gelman. We'll be continuing this conversation about the art of the obituary after a quick break. And you can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We've been talking about the art of obituaries and back with us now to discuss the considerations they make when they're reporting and writing is Kristen Hare. She writes obituaries for the Tampa Bay Times and Lucy Gelman, who's an editor for the arts paper in New Haven. Just a quick reminder that, hey, if you've written an obituary, have you thought about your own? You can join the conversation 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook. Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Uh, Lucy, we ended the conversation earlier with Kristen saying there she finds sparks of life, you know, when she's doing these obituaries. And I really resonate. I find that resonating because when I talk to families and, and friends, I do see that spark of life because most of them are so willing and wanting to share these stories. How do you determine an obituary is done? And can you kind of give us a glimpse of of um, what are you able to to talk with with uh, people and their families? Mm. I think to your first question, Catherine, it's really hard because for me, um, it's like never done. I am constantly running against um, this thing where like I want to keep writing because I feel like I can keep writing about this person's life and there must be people I haven't talked to yet. But at some point, and maybe this is the blessing of journalism, deadline gets in the way and I think, oh goodness, I have to get this up. Um, I I think the other question, you know, that spark of life. So I had a, a colleague, Markeisha Ricks, whose writing is, is really fantastic. She was a writer at the New Haven Independent for a long time, who said to me, if you stay in this field, you're always going to feel a little bit like you're on the edge of discomfort. And sometimes I feel like that when I am having conversations with people who have lost someone, especially with uh, siblings and parents who have lost a child before their time. And I tend to, I, I tend to have long conversations. Sometimes they're 20 minutes, sometimes they're close to an hour where we talk about everything. And I like to get a really full idea of a person. I like to give the, the loved one a chance to share the full humanity of, of this person they knew who sometimes has has passed like very, very recently, you know, sometimes we're talking about 24 to 48 hours in which they've lost someone close to them. And then I also like to just let them riff and 
you know, talking to someone who is experiencing grief, like grief is not a linear process for any of us. And so sometimes they'll laugh at something or they'll share like a really hilarious anecdote and then they'll self self correct and they'll say, Oh my God, I'm, I'm sorry. I did that. I'm mourning this person. And I think it speaks to this complexity of how we remember the people that we've lost and that we've loved and in, in sharing obituaries to, to get back to the, the act of writing these, I'm trying to capture all of that because I think that there is also a lot of joy in remembering someone, even if it's someone who has, who's, who has gone or, or who has left us before their time. Does that answer your question, Catherine? No, absolutely. I think I think you just described, you know, humanity and and how there is still a human being behind the story, you know, behind the storytelling, right? Like you're trying to understand the person while being able to paint the full picture. And uh, believe me when I tell you, I understand how the deadline does help sometimes, because as a new, as a former newspaper writer, I tend to want to go on forever because you want to give. The person justice, right? And I, I'd also want to ask Kristen too. You know, what about you? You know, what have you learned over the years talking with with family and friends of of the people that you've written about? Yeah, I just want to want to agree with Lucy. You know, one hundred percent endorse. <laughs> this is so hard. <laughs> I think that's and three of us. It's so hard, and every single one that I write, I have to make myself pick up the phone. I have to make myself dial. Um, it is every single week. Um, a hurdle. And, and that reminds me that it's important, you know, from a technical aspect, I've been doing this on a weekly basis for five years now for the, for the Tampa Bay times. And one of the things I think I really enjoy about it as a, as a reporter and as a writer is every single person I'm talking to, you know, regardless of where they are in their grief and the person the you know, the, the place in life that the person they lost, lost was in, um, it is when we are grieving, we fall back on um, ways of speaking that that are really unspecific, right? So he was a great man. She had a heart for her family. Um, you know, th these sort of cliches that you'll hear. And my work, um, and I think the work of any obituary reporter is to break through that and to get to the specifics of what was it that they did that made them great or made them have a heart for their family or um you know made them made them the person that they were so there's some some mining that happens where you have to very gently chisel away um and to get them to give you specifics and examples it's not hard um i tend to cast a wide net and my first question is always what do you want people to know about this person? And then I can narrow in from there. And the, um, you know, the the theme of their story is always really clear to me. One of the things that I do um, that to me is a basic form of fact checking, but I don't know how how common it is, is when I'm finished writing after I've talked to a number of people that I feel like reflect who a person was, um, not just their family, not just their coworkers, um, but but enough of a variety is I have um, someone who I know knows them well go over the story with me. I don't send them the story that's against our policy, but I read them the headline. I go over the lead. We talk it through because I don't know this person and I I, I won't get to know them. This is my hypothesis based on what I've learned about who they were. And it's really important to me that particularly family members aren't surprised by what I'm writing. Um, these, in, in my case, these were not famous or well-known people. They didn't ask for this. I approached them and I don't want to do anything that's going to um, contribute any harm to them. And so th that can happen, um, you know, b because of where people are in their grieving process. So I want to be as, as careful um, and as respectful as I can. And I usually tell people from the start, I want you to be in the passenger seat with me on this journey. And that means, you know, we're going to be real careful with details. And I have found that that preserves the relationship after something has posted, even if, um, you know, the story isn't glowing and they never are. Um, and hopefully brings them, um, help, helps them get to know journalists in a way that is meaningful and powerful and gets past um, some of the rhetoric that's out there um, about the work, who we are and the work that we do. 
And something else that we've also been grappling with, uh, Kristen, is uh, you tracked the death of local newsrooms over the course of the pandemic and eventually capping the headline at more than 100 local newsrooms closed. Can you give us a sense of how creative newsrooms were, you know, despite what's happening, especially in adapting to cover not just COVID, but also just the scale of the loss of life in the local communities. You know, just to name a few, New York Times, Boston Globe, and your own Tampa Bay Times also all had projects related to to COVID-related deaths. Yeah, the San Francisco Chronicle, um, you know, every basically um, every newsroom that, you know, local newsrooms that um, that cover their communities, I think very quickly saw that there was going to be, uh, you know, a massive and unprecedented loss of life um, and that they wanted to capture whatever they could. That work was incredibly hard. I wasn't part of the team of the Tampa Bay Times that did it, but I watched them um, and they wanted, you know, a line, something that they could have to to remember that this happened. And, um, you know, most of those projects have, have long since closed. But um, again, I think it shows and it's just the instinct that Lucy and I have now when we're Um, you know, in times that I don't know what we would call these times, but whatever these times are, um, I think it, I think it's just like, this is a role that communities and their news organizations can, can have together to witness what's happening and to share it and to make sure that people don't die um, anonymously. One of my favorite obits, um, Catherine, that I wrote uh, very big at the very beginning was um, a, a, a lady contacted me and she said, you know, we had a resident. Um, this was in a care facility. He passed away. His obituary said that he wasn't survived by anyone, but that's not true. We survive him and we want you to know his story. And so I wrote the story about a man who had lots of troubles in his life, um, loved Halloween and horror movies, kept a jar of peanut butter by his bed, fretted over paying his bills on time and loved spaghetti and meatballs. And they had a little party for him to remember him. So I I think as much as we can keep people in, you know, the thick of the pandemic before and after, um, as if we can hold space for people publicly, whether that's um, in newspapers or um, any place in media or online, I think that's a, a really important thing we can do for each other. You've been listening to Tampa Bay Times and Pointer writer Kristen Hare and arts paper editor Lucy Gelman. They'll be staying with us. Coming up next, we'll hear from a Minnesota woman who's been sharing insights from the obituary she reads on TikTok. Mary McGreevy, a.k.a. Tips from Dead People, will join us. Do you have memories from a lost loved one or tips from dead people that you'd like to share? You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Joining us now to expand this conversation about obituary writing and reading is Mary McGreevy, a.k.a. Tips from Dead People on TikTok. She's also the co-founder of Epilogue, an online platform where people can publish memories of their loved ones for free. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And still with us is Kristen Hare, who's a writer for Pointer and Tampa Bay Times, as well as Lucy Gelman, who is an editor for the arts paper in New Haven. So, Mary, I want to get started with you. You know, how did you get started on this path? Well, I come at it from two different directions. The first one is just that I have always had this very strange hobby of collecting obituaries that interest me. For a long time, um, my mother was an obituary writer for our local paper in South Dakota and later a personal um, history writer for people's memoirs. So I've always had this idea of story in my head. And I I literally have a folder of hundreds of obituaries that I've collected over the years because they interest me and they've taught me something about my own life. And at some point I thought there must be a way to share this. There maybe is a community of people who's also interested um, in these obituaries and might have the same hobby that I do and gets the same joy out of it. So I have young teenage kids and I did at the time and I uh, they're older now, but I started a TikTok account and thought, 
maybe someone's out there. And as it turns out, it's a, a perfect platform for that. So I called it Tips from Dead People. And I post um, videos about where I, about particular obituaries that I have found interesting or insightful or humorous or provocative and what I can learn from those about my own life. And um, it's the kind of classic TikTok thing where you post a video and then all of a sudden you go to bed and the next morning there's a million views. <laughs> so there's a conversation to be had out there with people about obituaries. And for that account, <clears throat> I choose obituaries that are not well known. These are not people of traditional achievement or accomplishment. And I think it's richer for that um, because it really, um, it's it's something that a lot of people can identify with. And there's a ton of humor uh, to Lucy's point. And I think that a lot of that humor really does help with the grief process. Um, and then the second direction that I come to obituaries um, at is that my mother-in-law passed away in 2015. She pre-wrote her own obituary dutifully, and um, she was a Texas woman with a great, colorful life. And we went to publish it in the paper, and it was uh, $1,200 for the day. And that was the first time that I, just as a random you know, subscriber to newspapers really understood how expensive it was. And I thought in this age of wedding sites like The Knot and Minted, where you have free creative control over this big life milestone, why isn't it the same for death? Um, so I got together with some other entrepreneurs here in Minnesota, and we founded a company called Epilogue, which is just that. It's a free platform to post life stories. And there are other similar companies out there as well. So when I'm listening um, very, with great interest about these trends and obituaries, um, but, I, but I think this idea of free and online, the time has come in the death space. And that should be on a bumper sticker, Mary. Let me just say <laughs> the time. <laughs> a know, very I'm, niche bumper sticker. Absolutely. Um, and I want to ask, you know, what are some of the biggest tips you've gleaned from people? And why do you think humor is such an essential piece for this? Well, let's see. The biggest tip that I have gotten from these obituaries is really kind of a theme. And the theme goes to Kristen's point about not wanting to see just a resume or a CV in, a, in an obituary. The, the biggest tip that I take from all of these is that the little things in life are really the big things. And by that, I mean, in life, we think we're on this hamster wheel of achievement and milestones and promotions and home purchases and, and these kinds of things that, that's meaningful to a lot of people in their life. When it comes to the end of life and the stories that we tell about people, those kinds of traditional markers rarely show up. So the things that make for a great story, an obituary that really conveys a well-loved person or even not a well-loved person, um, are the little things, the the pranks, the practical jokes, the foods that they love, the trips that they took, their, their foibles, their controversies, their failures even. Those are the kinds of things in these stories that really stand out as meaningful. And you can read obituaries from now till the end of time about people who aren't famous, and yet these obituaries are oozing with love, and you think, I'm inspired by that. I need to take things for my life from that. And it's always the little things. It's maintaining tiny relationships. It's doing the works of charity when nobody's watching. It's the dad jokes. Um, you know, it's, it's all kinds of things like that, that that make an obituary really stand out and inspire me. Well, I think you just took all the words out of my mouth because I love that you mentioned the tiny things are the big things because we were also talking about earlier, you know, it's the tiny histories, but they're really not tiny in these people's lives. Um, but for, for some people, you know, the histories, like you mentioned, it may not be that great. And which leads to the question, uh, Anne from Connecticut was wondering, what happens when you are asked to write an obituary that people don't have nice things to say about the person? How do you handle that, Mary? <laughs> Well, I'm not an obituary writer, first of all. So I I mean, I've helped people along the way because I'm a, an enthusiast and a hobbyist here, but I, I'm not a professional like, like Kristen and Lucy. But I can say that I've read many, many obituaries that that address this issue of someone who was controversial or perhaps not well-loved. There's a few 
on the spectrum that are just straight up savage to a person. And I don't advocate that they, they tend to make the news in a negative way. And then there's on the other side of the spectrum, there's, uh, you know, everything positive and so forth. But in the middle, there are lots of obituaries that really do address this issue of this person wasn't a great dad. Let's all admit it. He had priorities other than his family, but here are some other things about it. And through these experiences we've learned and we've grown, I think there's ways to handle that very um, calmly and appealingly. And also back to the humor thing, it's very, very appealing when someone can address something with dry humor. And it, I believe those kinds of approaches really do help with the grief process, especially if that person has a complicated history with addiction or or crime or, you know, I've, I've read all kinds of, of obituaries where that where the person is not a hero. And yet there's a good story to be told. I certainly read my fair share of uh, obituaries where we start with dry humor, and that actually tends to get a lot of really positive attention. So I'm ha- I'm happy to hear that. Actually, uh, Kristen, I wanted to ask, you know, how does this get to our maybe very limited idea of life and how to celebrate it? You know, what tips do you have for people who might want to start memorializing their loved ones now, or even themselves? Yeah, I. This is so shaped <laughs> me and how I spend time with my family. Um, and, and, you know, I often say to people that I coach through my work at pointer, like you take the vacation. (laughs) I'm an obituary reporter. Let me just suggest that you do the things that bring you joy and that make the world a better place. And that you do them now. Um, I think that, um, you know, people who want to, to be part of this and want to do it, like just start doing it. There is a, great guide. Um, There are lots of great guides on the internet for um, doing oral histories. I did one with my uncle while he was dying from pancreatic cancer. And um, again, someone I knew from a very limited perspective and got to have many more viewpoints of who he was, his career, um, his family, um, what he meant to people other than just my my own family. And um, so if you can sit down with someone and and walk them through some questions, um, I recommend taking breaks because it can be heavy, um, especially as people are aging to bring up, you know, uh, things that they're thinking about things they haven't thought about in years. But um, it's just a gift um, to to for you and for the people in your life. And so, you know, again, there's no guarantees. Don't delay. This is something worth doing immediately. And Lucy, we've been talking a lot about obviously the art of obit- obituary writing and 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 actually it's really very much focused on life can you speak about the importance of focusing on how the people lived versus how they died and just especially yeah. considering the prevalence of perhaps gun violence in the US right now absolutely um so often this is one of the first conversations that i have with families and loved ones and Sometimes they will say, please don't talk about the way my brother or my uncle or my, and and sometimes it's someone who's been sick for a very long time, I will say. So last year, our city librarian passed and this was someone I loved as a city official and he had been sick for a long time. And then we also lost someone later that year, Semi Semi Dococo, who again had been sick, like he had been sick for probably four or five years and we knew it was coming. Um, But often people will say to me, I do not want to focus on the way that my loved one died. I really would like you to focus on the way that they lived. And implicitly in that, they're putting a lot of trust in me not to muck up the story, right? And so I also think about how obituaries, uh, I'm, I'm not a person who believes in heaven. I don't think obituaries are for the dead. I think obituaries are are for the living. And it's something that I can give to people who are deep in their grief. And so for me, the task at hand is to talk to people until I get a full idea of how someone lived. And to very briefly address Anne's question from earlier, I think that um, I have never written an obituary, I guess I'm lucky, where someone has said, oh, he was a real SOB, or I I hated this person. Um, But I have written three obituaries about people who took their own lives. And there there has been a lot of anger in those interviews. Um, because sometimes people believe that mental health um, and suicide and suicidality is a moral failing. And in those, I have worked very hard to focus on the way that people lived 
in the same way that I do if someone passes of cancer or of heart disease or of COVID-19. And I think the importance there is to show people, coming back to a point that Kristen made very early, to show people what we have in common. It's not about who you voted for. It's not about uh, sort of what ideological side of the, the continuum you're on. It's, a, it's about how you contributed to the world, whether your corner of the world was New Haven or Connecticut or something bigger. And so I think in that way, it's getting a very full fo- uh, very full image of, of how a person lived from different people. And again, to Kristen's point, from different people who knew them in different ways. So family members, colleagues, friends, and so on and so forth. Well, I'm, I can certainly resonate with the with that feeling of I'm in a constant dread of mucking up someone's story. So I appreciate you uh, saying that. I do want to ask this question to Kristen, too. You know, um, are there are there models that need to change in your view in terms of how obituaries are written? Yes, for sure. Um, I, and I want to say with the last thing, you know, the last question that we've been talking about, about people who are complicated, we are all complicated. And anybody who tells you that someone was all all good um, is lying to you. The question that I ask, because I do want to show people's quirks and their flaws, and I want to do it gently, um, because that feels um, honest, um, but also kind, is like, what were what were their quirks? What, what was a thing that they did that no one else d- did? Did they have their coffee a certain way? Were they insistent um, that things be a certain way? Were they always losing their keys? And those those kinds of questions can give you um, insights into a person, and I often will use them with humor. Um, I wrote about a woman who was a star on um, the showboat stage, and and it said, you know, she died um, at this age. I mean, at this time of this, don't you dare ask her age. You know, you could understand from that line that she was um, a little bit a little bit vain. Um, and I completely forgot your the rest of your question. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. And I, I actually, we only have about one one minute left. But I do want to um, ask Mary too. You know, your thoughts. You know, we you know we know we know you co-founded Epilogue, which is a free digital platform, um, which is uh, a new model for obituaries. Are there other changes that you feel like we need to approach when it comes to this kind of storytelling? I do. And I, I appreciate Kristen listing the media sites where they're choosing to prioritize free obituaries and community engagement over the classified ad department where obituaries have been placed for all these decades. So I think that's the first biggest, if media wants to stay relevant in this space, in the obituary space, and not have it go completely the way of like wedding sites and so forth outside of the media space, then they need to do that. I I firmly believe that. And I do believe that there's a way to um, increase loyalty in the community um, instead of that revenue. That's the first thing. Um, And I know you are close to out of time here, but I do think to busting up the templates of what you think a good obituary should be, that's the next best thing. We love that very much. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Mary McGreevy is uh, Tips from Dead People on TikTok, also the co-founder of Epilogue. And you've also been listening to Kristen Hare, who's a writer for Pointer and Tampa Bay Times, as well as Lucy Gelman, an editor for the Arts Paper in New Haven. Thank you all so much for this amazing conversation today. Thanks for making space for it. I'm Thank happy. you. Thank you. And I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.